I started to write down 40 reasons why we love Chris. Well, I worked hard on it, Kelly, okay? Kelly asked how, how long did it take, and uh, so uh, I'll share that at another time, but there's a lot of 40s in the Bible, you know that, and uh, that's, that's an interesting 40 years of wandering and wilderness and all that, you know, so we won't, won't go there. Two, um, off, uh, two blessings that I want to just share with you this morning, you who are part of our church family, this is just pretty neat. Sometimes in the summer months, we're just, boy, Sunday to Sunday, people gone, vacations, all that sort of thing, and it, it affects our finances, and it's, it's hard, you know. And uh, last Sunday, we had just a great offering. And I know I come to you and say we have a need, but I want to tell you, thank you for your giving, your, your faithfulness. And then also last week, I shared with you about we're working towards uh, resealing the blacktop on the driveway, and it's a big number. I hate spending that kind of money, but it's the best situation we could find, and trustees did all the work, and everybody agreed that that's a good thing. And this last week, there was a uh, person came by to see me, and uh, they said, Dan, I want to share something with me, with you, and gave me a check for $1,500, okay? And uh, so we're, we're whittling that thing down, okay? And so if you'd like to help us, it just helps to seal coat the driveway, preserve it, and uh, so we'll be, um, we'll be good to go for a number of years. So anything you can do in the next few weeks, um, we're trying to take care of that. And we're keeping track of all that in the worship folder also. Today at 4 o'clock, Russ mentioned it, today at 4 o'clock there is a um, baptism and Laura is the only one so far to be baptized, okay? And uh, Laura would like to have someone to be baptized with her, okay? And once a year we go out to the creek and uh, we have a baptism here, but Laura doesn't like cold water. She wants nice warm water where she can see the tadpoles and everything else floating down the water, okay? And so it's gonna be a lot of fun. We have watermelon afterwards and we just have a little, little fellowship service there. It's four o'clock, just I think you'll really enjoy it. And uh, just, uh, just come and enjoy. It'll not be a long service um, unless we can't get Laura up and I'm sure we will, and uh, she's ignoring me this morning, okay? But uh, so seriously, come at four, and uh, want to uh, invite you to be a part of that. I want to ask you a question this morning. Can you imagine what it would be like being a Christian and a follower of Jesus Christ when, in, when it was against the law Everywhere you would go, you would be afraid that your neighbor would turn you in, somebody you work with would turn you in, a relative, someone maybe who was upset with you or didn't like something in you, how you did something. But everywhere you would go, you would be kind of looking over your shoulder and making sure that no one was watching you and everything was okay. That was the society that the scripture that I want to share with you here in a moment, that's what was going on. James is, we've been reading and working and studying in the book of James this summer, and we've kind of called this under construction. And it's really our faith and our walking with Christ that is continually being, is growing and, and developing. But in that society today, James is the brother of Jesus. He's the younger brother of Christ. As I mentioned a few times, he had not become a follower of Jesus until he was just a, uh, after the resurrection. James is a powerful writer, and he's writing to Christians who are under persecution. James, even himself, was martyred as being a Christian. 
It was common for the Roman society at that point, the laws had changed. Nero was the emperor of Rome and he hated Christians. It was terrible things what he would do to Christians. He would take Christians and skin them and dip them in tar and light his gardens with these Christians. I mean, it was just terrible persecution that was going on. And these believers had just scattered all over the countryside. And they were just trying to, to survive all of the stuff that's going on in their life. And how do you stay focused? This is what I want to kind of work on this morning. How do you stay focused in a hostile environment? How, are you, how do you stay growing spiritually? How do you keep the fire strong? The characteristic of fire is to go out. You've got to keep it going all the time. And how do you keep yourself focused in the midst of such anguish and, and, and persecution? These early Christians, literally, they just scattered across the countryside. Many of them lost family members, lost their homes, their jobs, their farms, just to get away from all of the persecution that's taking place. How do you look out after your brother and sister in Christ when you're in that type of a atmosphere and that much stress and persecution? Can you, who do you trust? Who don't you trust? Who do you rely on? Who is it that you are responsible for, especially if you have a family and you need to protect them, you need to guard over them? And so this is the atmosphere that James is writing in. This is around 62 AD, 62, 69, after the, um, the birth of Christ. And it's right during that time period when all this is taking place. Now I've got a video, a short video I wanna show you this morning. And it's a video that's talking about moving forward when the pressure and society and everything is working against you. It is a good little two minute little teaching point here, okay? So would you look at this with me this morning? The way of the world, the familiar, the routine, drifting toward the same ends heading off in the distance, as if there was no other way. But when you meet Christ, you realize there's a different direction, a guide that invites you on a counter-cultural pilgrimage. You find a sweet harmony in conversation, in step with him. You realize the blessing that it is to be near to him. He asks you to drop everything, to follow the path toward him. And while the walk is certainly not without its challenges, you are not left unattended. But it's easy to lose focus. It may not be intentional, but if you're not disciplined to move, the gap can widen and you'll become used to your callousness. He desires to have you close and you remember how pleasing it is. But the affairs of the world can become rather overwhelming. And there are times when you feel trapped, times when you get preoccupied, distracted, pushed, pulled, bogged down. And you realize the instant that you're not actively moving toward him, you're moving away from him. Remember who called you to this journey and run to him. Wow. Isn't that powerful? Let me ask you a couple questions that go with that this morning. We don't face what James is facing in that early church, but we face the, the constant pull of the world and society to pull us back. 
there is a continual pressure. And as you saw there, if we stand in one place very long and we don't keep in step with Christ, we lose ground very quickly. It is intentional. And the second is, it doesn't take much to become distracted. To bend down and tie your shoes is, is very necessary. In fact, there's a lot of necessary things to do. Our jobs, our school, to mow grass, to pay taxes. But it can become so easy that our lives are so full that we are not staying in step with Christ. When we opened our heart to him, he became so overwhelming in us and around us. And there's two vital questions I want to ask you. First of all, how's your walk? How's your walk? What are you doing to stay in step with Christ? And are you being intentional? If you're not being intentional, the pull, it takes its toll on all of us. It begins to pull us in directions we don't want to go. And secondly, do you know of a brother or a sister in Christ who is moving away? Maybe it's just gradual, but you sense something in their life that's changed and their focus isn't as, as clear and their heart is not as open. They're not as hungry. They're not thirsty. They're not growing in their walk. And you sense it and you feel it and you see it. And so James is writing to these believers that are in so much persecution, so much pressure is coming upon them. And James is called the Proverbs of the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the book of Proverbs is the wisdom of God. James is sharing with us the wisdom of God in the New Testament. Now, James is not a doctrinal book, perhaps like Colossians or Ephesians or Romans or Corinthians, some of those, those books like that. But it's, it's words of inst instruction, information, and wisdom that God gives to us. And so it's the last two verses in the five chapters in James. And this is what I want to look at. This is what I want to focus on here this morning with you. James 5 and verse 19 and verse 20. Remember again what's happened in, in, the, in society in James. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth, and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from the wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. Now, again, James is writing to Christians. It is after everything that he says about walking with God and who God is and how to share your life with God, it's the last part of his writing is he says, P.S., by the way, you are responsible for your brother and sister in Christ. After everything is saying about our faith and our prayers and all of those different things, he says, now I want you to talk, I want to talk to you about those who are very dear to you, those who are important in your life. That's your brothers and sisters in Christ. So here's in your outline, if you're following along. First of all, number one, Christians can fall. Would you notice in verse 19, he says, if someone among you wanders away from the truth. We know that James is talking to Christians because they would have to, they would, they would have to be in the truth at one time in order to wander from it. We must be aware of the real possibilities of falling away from our desire and our commitment to Jesus Christ. Some believe that it cannot happen. I personally believe that it can happen, but it normally happens very, very gradually. As I read the Bible, there are scriptures, different verses once in a while that just kind of just jump off those scriptures to me. Let me share with one is one with you this morning, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4. He says, For you are trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law. Now he's talking about Christians who are just trying to go back. These are Jewish Christians trying to go back just to keep the Ten Commandments. 
believing that's what God wants. But he goes on and he says, he says, but you've been cut off from Christ. You're not dependent on him. You have fallen away from God's grace. They have pulled themselves back from dependence upon the Lord. So it's more than just inviting him into our heart. I have to walk with him. I have to be a part of him. James does not write that this person has denied Christ or even fallen from grace. But what he's saying, he says they are struggling. They're wandering. They're being pulled back by all that's going on. Number two, God used humans to do his work. Notice in verse 19 again, if you would. He says, and this is written to Christians. He says, um, dear brothers, my dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back. So we who are a part of the family of God. We have that responsibility. They're my brothers and sisters. Verse 20, he goes on and say, whoever brings the sinner back will share that person from death. Meaning the one who restores him is saving that person so much heartache and so many problems and so much uh, difficulties in the future. He's saying he's just keeping him from that situation. There's two things that's needed. First of all, a genuine love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. The Bible calls the church a family, and we operate much like a family. We have family-type relationships. We, we call each other brothers. We call each other sisters. We think of the operational and the structure of the church much like the family. We know that the Father, God, has authority, and so we follow his instructions. Um, so the church becomes very, very important to us. A healthy, loving, caring church family that cares genuinely and is a, and, and even accountable to one another in their growth. Galatians chapter 6 says this, share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. So there needs to be in my life, there has to be a group of believers, somebody who I can have, I can do life with, someone who I can understand this Christian life with. I can learn from them. They learn from me. We grow together. We encourage one another. Kelly this week sent me a verse. It says something like, iron sharpens iron from Proverbs. And it's just being around those, those believers who just become so a part of our life and we a part of their life. Then when someone struggles, we become a part of the search committee. We become a part of the search and rescue team when they begin to stray away. There's a sensitivity. There's something in our heart that we understand. We know that something is not quite right. There's something else that has to happen. It's a willingness to say something to those who are wandering. Verse 20, it says, it brings the sinner back. It is not just feeling love and compassion. It is actually doing something. We can feel it, but we have to take those feelings and put them into actions. You're my brother. You're my sister. I care about you. I, I want to know who you are. I want to be involved in your life. And if there's something wrong, I want to be there for you. Now, you've got to understand the context of the scripture in this world where James is coming from. There's so much persecution and martyrdom and, and, and families torn apart. They really needed each other. And I don't say this in a wrong way, but sometimes it could be the reason you're going through difficulties right now is you need each other. This is God's way many times of bringing us together. One of the beautiful things that happened in 2008, after the economy had kind of taken a, a dive down and 
I've heard all kinds of words to describe it, depression and all of that sort of thing. One of the positive things that happened is it started to break down the church, the walls in churches, and churches started ministering together in ways that it had never had before. We needed each other. We could not do it on our own. And it took a financial collapse, at least in this community, for churches to start recognizing and working together and being a part of each other's life. The crisis you have may be from the Lord to allow you to build a relationship with one with another. So I am my brother's keeper. I am to be involved. You're to be involved in the life of others. In 1884, there was a minister whose name was James Wells, and he wrote a book. It was the, about the parables of Jesus. And in that book, he told a story of a little girl carrying her brother. Her brother was nearly as big as she was. And somebody saw her carrying her little brother. And she said, they said to him, isn't he heavy? And you know the song, some of you, that Neil Diamond made popular in 1969. Ask Chris, he'll tell you the words. He was, he, that's one of his favorite songs back there, you know. You know. And, and, and the words go something like this. He ain't heavy, he's mutt. He's my brother. He's my brother. Well, sure he's heavy. Sure it's difficult. Sure it takes a lot of energy and a lot of strength to pack someone around that's just as big as you are. But he's not heavy. Because I've invested into his life. He's a part of me. I'm a part of him. He's my brother. And I need him in my life, and he needs me in my life, and we become family. Isolation just will absolutely destroy the family of God. It'll absolutely destroy Christians. It'll absolutely just hurt in many ways. And James is telling these Christians that are under persecution, they're scattered all over the countryside, literally for their lives. And he says, even though you don't come together, he says, you're still responsible for one another. You still need to check up on each other. So I'm sure in 62 AD, they took their phones and they text each other. How are you doing today? They had Roman towers all over the place. You know, I don't know how they did it. I'm not, Chris would know. I mean, he would, he's... He, he knows all those things from history like that, you know. Uh, but they were responsible. They were involved. They cared. They loved. They trusted each other. The stronger the church is, the stronger the relationships are. Now, let me ask you a question. Is all relationships easy? Is all relationships fun? Remember, he's not heavy. He's my what? He's my brother. Yeah, some relationships are heavy. Some relationships do require extra grace. Some relationships do require us to, you know, God, I can do this. <laughs> you did a lot for me, and, and I'm going to be invested in the lives of someone else. I'm going to bring quality into their lives. I'm going to build into their lives. Folks, it is so easy when we are going through hardships to isolate and pull back and just depend upon yourself. You know, it occurred to me this week, you Bible scholars, I want you to dwell on and think about this for a minute. Do you know, it just hit me, the prodigal son's older brother did not even go look for his younger brother. Did you ever think of that? It just hit me this week. Uh, the younger brother, you, you who know the story, the prodigal son, he took his, his father's inheritance early and he spent it, and the Bible says, on wild living and, and partying like Chris will do tomorrow on his birthday. And, see, you're right in front of me, bud. I'm sorry. I used to pick on Pam, and it's your day, okay? So, uh, no, he's not going to do a wild party. I don't think. I, I, I have my questions sometimes, you know. 
But here in the midst of all of this stuff, all of the partying going on, the younger son left the father out of rebellion. He, he took what, it was, his attitude was so wrong. It was right for the father to wait for the son to come back. That's a good, healthy boundary that God sets for us. But what about that stinking elder brother? He, 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 he's, he's, even his father, he was criticizing his father for taking care of the younger brother. Remember the story in Luke 15? And, and, and he told his dad, Dad, I didn't do anything wrong. You know why? He wasn't doing anything right. He spent all of his time just checking off. I'm not, what's that old saying? I, I don't smoke or chew or go with girls who do or something like that. Honestly, I've never gone with a girl who chewed, you know. <laughs> That's pretty f profound, isn't it? You know, that? pretty deep stuff, you know, you know. But the elder, Rena keeps shaking her head, you know. <laughs> so the elder brother is checking it off. I've done, not done anything wrong, done nothing wrong, done nothing wrong, done nothing wrong. Isn't that sad that we as believers... The walk with Jesus comes down to, I've done nothing wrong, I've done nothing wrong, I've done nothing wrong. And the elder brother in his attitude, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, because I've done nothing wrong. And they never see the compassion and the mercy of Jesus. They could at least love draws you into action, doesn't it? You care for somebody you got to do something you love on them you go to them and the elder brother was so concerned about doing right he wasn't doing what Jesus would ask him to do what he calls us to do third thing here is why are we prone to wander as believers the hymn writer said it he gives us these words he says prone to wander Lord I feel it prone to leave the God I love man I feel that I, I know that I mentioned earlier it's hard to keep fire burning you got to keep putting more fuel into it it's hard to keep your heart burning that the desire for God the flames to draw to be strong and, and consistent in order to do that you've got a spiritual appetite you got to feel the word the fellowship the prayer obedience all of those things just fuel that fire getting around other Christians who can encourage and strengthen but there's two things, I think, first of all, that makes Christians wander. The first one is spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. Notice in 1 Peter 4, verse 12 and 13. Notice, if you would, the scripture. He says, dear friends, don't be surprised at the what? Fiery trials. What does that sound like? That sounds like the pits. That sounds like trouble. That sounds like somewhere you don't want to go, somewhere you definitely don't want to stay. It's a problem. He says, don't be surprised by that. He goes on, he says, you are going through it as if something strange were happening to you. And can I just say here this morning, if you're stoking your heart and you're keeping yourself close to Christ and you're in step with him and moving with him, Satan is jealous of that. He doesn't want your heart open. He is jealous of the Jesus that is moving and working and operating in you. And he comes at us in many strange different ways. 
Sometimes it's relationships, sometimes it's a financial or a health or all kind of crazy things that happen. It's warfare and it's real. And can I say this this morning? Warfare is normal in the Christian life. Would you say those words with me? Warfare is normal in the Christian life. That's what he says. Don't think it's strange when these things happen to you. Ideal, the ideal in our life. And why do we do this? We just want everything to be normal. What's normal today? Huh? What is normal today? Normal today is warfare that comes and opposition that comes and heartaches that come. Problems sometimes are just overwhelming. You think, why? What in the world is going on? That's the world James lives. Folks, that's becoming the world we live in too. The second thing is, just to share with you this morning, is misplaced priorities. The greatest resource that we have is our time. And how we spend our time dictates who we are and what we become. And to try to be of help and be a little transparent if I can with you. When after I become a Christian and ask Jesus in my life, there was a my whole teenage years was a struggle. I was on, I was off. I was on, I was off. It took me until I was 18 until I really made it really serious at that point. And I was only serious at that point is because everything else I depended upon was falling apart. And I got really desperate. Desperation is a good motivation, isn't it, to get us to where we need to be spiritually. But even after I had come to Christ, there were some hardships in my life. And there were key people that God brought into my life at the right time, at the right place, who was just there for me. And this is a transparency I want to share with you. Most Christians, they falter two or three some times more than at times before they really get understanding and get desperate and figure out that there really is no other way to live and then their spiritual eyes really get open at that point so what are we supposed to do with those who in our lives that are struggling do we just throw them out well do we just give up on them? No, we can't do that. The other day I stopped at the house for lunch. It's a good thing I came home. There was a major, major, major crisis going on at the house. Pam was watching Chase. Chase is our three year, almost three year old in September. And the price crisis was he lost Ellie. Ellie is his pacifier. Uh -huh. And Chase, it's time to go down for a nap. Last week, Mama forgot to bring Ellie, and Ellie means an elephant. His pacifier's first one's had an elephant on it, okay? So Ellie, of course you all know, you grandmas know all that stuff, don't you, you know? So Ellie's the name of his little pacifier. So when I walked in the door, Pam was looking at me, and Chase was looking at me, no more Ellie, no more Ellie. Well, I knew that it would be a, first of all, I wouldn't have lunch, you know. <laughs> and little Chase wouldn't be taking a nap. So I got down on my hands and knees and I found Ellie. I had fallen off in a stand next to his bed where he was supposed to, to lay. And I took Ellie and I showed his pacifier and said, here, Chase, here's Elliot, his eyes got big and life is good again and he had nap and I had my lunch and Pam was happy and life was good. Hmm. Sometimes it takes effort, doesn't it? Just to go find those who are broken and need our help. 
the lost, those who are struggling, those who are in our lives that we just need a little extra help, a little extra time or energy, someone misplaced priorities. Sometimes, can I say it, we get so focused in our own world that we forget about others that God has brought into our life for us to minister to. Do you hear me? And can I step on a couple of toes and I want to do it gently? I love you and I care about you. But sometimes I've had those and, and I understand where it comes from. People will say, Dan, so-and-so's not in church. Where are they? And, you know, but there are some times I've wanted to say, why don't you call them? Why don't you text them? Why is it Dan has to know where so-and-so is? Isn't that your brother too? Isn't that your sister too? Can we be so ingrained in our own world that we forget the world that Jesus is developing around us? Am I really responsible? Do I really become involved? No, I don't want you to be nosy and be in someone's business. There's nothing spiritual about that. Notice in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, I'm jumping back here on you, uh, Alice, Alyssa, but Galatians 6 verse 1, would you? Notice what he says. He says to us, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, spiritually just struggling, wandering, you who are godly should with pride and arrogance help that person get back onto the right path and tell them what a dirty sinner they are and that you would never do something like that. Wow. Gently and humbly. Um, and, 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 and he goes, in the last part of it, and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. He says when you're pulling someone else up, don't get so close to the edge that you fall in yourself, you know. But gently, humbly saying, hey, brother, sister, how you doing? I just want you to know I was thinking about you and just wanted to check on you. Are, are you okay? Your, your walk okay? Your heart's okay? Everything's doing okay, you know? Just, just, you know, see what happens. See what lands. And if it's fine, you just say, well, that's great. I just, just was thinking about you. Um, I've never had a brother or sister ever cuss me out for asking that. I've never had one be offended. Most times they'll say, well, thanks for thinking of me. Thanks for even caring about me. The prophet said in the Old Testament, no man cares for my soul. No one cares for my soul. Do I care? Do I care? Enough just to, hey, I want to be responsible for you. Um, the fourth thing here, and I'll try to hurry quickly because we've got a birthday boy that's needs, it's getting older by the moment here, you know. <laughs> I'm really, I'm really burying myself, you know. I'm in trouble. Number four, your greatest source of joy is helping to restore a wandering believer your greatest source of joy. Now, why do I say that? Go back with me, if you would, in Luke 15. There's a couple of verses I want you to read and want you to see with me. It says, so Jesus told them, st them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one is lost? Until he finds it, commitment, he's not heavy, he's my brother. Uh, and when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it in, 
it home on his shoulder. And when he arrives, he will call together his friends and his neighbor, saying, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more, say it with me, joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God, over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Joy in heaven, listen this morning, leaks on earth. Joy in heaven makes joyful believers on this earth that we live in. God doesn't have joy without it coming into your life. The greatest joy you can have is being with a brother or sister and putting your arms around them and just bringing them back to safety. Notice the next story he shares in verse 8 and 9 of that. Suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp, sweep the entire house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she finds it, she will call in her friends and her neighbors and says, What? Rejoice with me because I found my lost coin. She has a party. Everybody's excited. Everybody's happy. Everyone is ready to love and care and, and take care of one another again. It's called work. Leaving the 99 going for one. It's comfortable being with the 99. You know, it's comfortable. We all have good time, fellowship time. But leaving the 99, you gotta look different, act different, go somewhere different than where you are. The 10 coins or the 10 things was a part of her bridal engagement. She couldn't get married if she didn't have all 10 coins. She was searching, she was looking just like I had to do for Ellie, save Pam, you know. Get involved, had to do something. I hate this commercial. I hate this commercial. It's called Life Alert. You own it? We'll give one to Chris, all right? <laughs> Life Alert, do you know, everybody knows, any, everybody hadn't watched that crummy commercial? Put up your hand. Yeah, Matt hasn't, bless his heart. Matt raised his, not you, not you. You've not, you've not wasted any time, you know. They always got this poor little lady who's fallen, she's on the floor, and she's saying those words. New York's done good for you, bud, you know. <laughs> I'm falling, I'm falling, I can't get up. What's the answer? If you don't have the necklace, guess what? I'm helping you out, Chris, okay? You know, you got to order those things. Yeah. But when you're falling and you got the button, what does it say? Three days later they'll come after you or something like that? Or I don't know. It's a terrible commercial, isn't it? I just, this poor lady, as I'm just thinking, you know, I just, I think of my mother. <laughs> I, I, I think of some elderly folks who have been in those situations, you know, before. Life alert. You just press the button and somebody comes, helps you get back up, helps put you back in order. If someone pressed the life alert around here, who would go to the rescue? If a brother or sister hit the life alert button, who goes to the rescue? Hmm? Wow. My brothers and sisters, we are family, aren't we? And I just beg of you, 
own your brother and sister. Love on them. Get involved in their lives. Small groups, we're going to be talking about that in a few weeks. It's a great, great way to develop friendships. Healthy people, loving and caring, not being nosy. You know, you don't ever say anything you're uncomfortable with. You know, you never, that's not what we're about. Well, how can I help you? How can I help you? I'm done here, but I've got to say this. Everybody I know has got a heavy load they're carrying. Everybody I know has got a heavy load. Do you hear me? Everybody I know, everybody in your life has got a heavy load. Jesus said, I'm to be a burden bearer. I'm just to be a part of their life and just help. What can I do to help? What can I be a part of your life? I'm going to ask you two things. First of all, if you're a Christian this morning, and it's a heavy, heavy load you're carrying, it, it's it, the pressures of life, the spiritual warfare, whatever it is, there's just, it's heavy. You feel it. You know it. You sense it. You're in a, it's a, it's a heavy time. Um, maybe you need the prayers of your brothers and sisters just coming around you. Tuesday night, I was so excited. We had a neat prayer time turned into just a healing prayer time of those just bringing their needs to the Lord. I just encourage you this morning, just allow God to do something big and new and real. If you're this morning, maybe you've been wandering and you see it and you feel it and you know it and you hear it today. God's speaking to you. Do something about it. Stop the wandering. Make the effort. The young guy in the video, he started running, running towards Jesus. Just make the effort. Would you stand with me? Father God, we love you this morning.